This material has been excerpted from the college television course, The Mechanical Universe, and re-edited specifically for use in the high school curriculum. The Mechanical Universe is funded by the Annenberg CPB Project, made possible by a grant from the National Science Foundation. beaker of oil, a sturdy iron pot, just enough power, a dash of discipline, a measure of creativity, and perhaps a touch of genius. These were the essential ingredients in the physicist's very experimental recipe. The scientist, Robert A. Milliken, the achievement measuring the value of the charge of the electron. At the turn of the 20th century, J.J. Thompson showed that cathode rays are parts of atoms. This brilliant Englishman had discovered the electron and developed the cloud method to measure its charge. Thompson and his student, H.A. Wilson, set out to determine the average charge on a typical droplet. The cloud chamber method was difficult. The experiments, which involved measuring the rate of fall of the cloud in an electric field, were subject to countless uncertainties. Nonetheless, they finally obtained an estimate of the electron charge. Only an estimate. But it was correct in its order of magnitude. Millikan repeated Wilson's experiments at the University of Chicago. To ionize the gaseous cloud in the chamber, he used X-rays at first, and then small amounts of radium. He tried a more powerful electric field in the chamber. If this worked, it would be powerful enough to balance the force of gravity and to keep the cloud suspended without motion. When the electrical field was turned on, the cloud disappeared but individual droplets stayed in view. Millikan imagined measuring the charge on single water droplets rather than an entire cloud. If it were possible to make measurements on the droplets, the charge of an individual electron could be detected. A brilliant insight, but not without a problem. Water evaporates. Instead of water, Millikan wondered, why not use droplets of oil? Oil, unlike water, doesn't evaporate. In 1907, at the University of Chicago, it began to fall into place. Given the apparatus to produce a mist of oil, Millikan was increasingly confident that the electrical charge of an electron could be accurately measured. Under his guidance, Harvey Fletcher, a graduate student from Brigham Young University, suggested an atomizer. Fletcher's first apparatus for the oil drop experiment, like Millikan's original idea, was simple, powerful, and altogether brilliant. It was a combination that began to work. The essence of the experiment is to apply an electric field 
to an electrically charged drop of oil falling through the air, and then to analyze the result using Newton's powerful equation, F equals ma. The mass of the drop times the acceleration is equal to the sum of all the forces acting on it. What forces act on a falling drop of oil? There's the force of gravity, of course. And then, there's the effect of viscosity, or air resistance. After a very short period of time, the oil drop reaches terminal velocity. Like any sphere falling through a viscous fluid, it falls at constant speed. Even with a powerful telescope, an individual drop was too small to see. What Millikan saw looked like a star in the night sky, a pinpoint of light that couldn't be resolved into its spherical shape. But by watching his star drift slowly from one scratch mark to another on his telescope, and using the known density of the oil, he could measure its precise size. Now he would turn on the electric field and create an electric force equal to the electric field's strength times the charge on the drop. That's the charge Millikan was really after. Due to one electron, or at most a small number of them, it would be an integer multiple of the fundamental unit of electric charge. With the electric force, he could drive the drop upward until once again it reached a constant speed. Together with the speed he'd measured with the field off, the new speed gave him everything he needed to find the charge. The experiment was designed with the most exquisite care, a hallmark of Millikan's work. To minimize turbulence on the oil drops as they drifted between parallel plates, a heavy iron pot was designed to house and protect the plates. Air would be filtered through glass wool before entering an atomizer designed to spray the finest mist of oil droplets into the chamber. Even the light to illuminate the droplets was filtered. A solution of copper sulfate and a meter-long tube of water would remove the light's excess heat. When the time came, Millikan saw to it that nothing would disturb his experiment. Stopwatch in hand, hour after hour, he would peer through his telescope through the porthole and into the chamber. Deep within the heart of the chamber, he would see a single charged droplet of oil, glowing like a star. Under the influences of gravity and viscosity, the droplet would fall. Down through inner space, the star would fall until it would reach the top scratch mark and Millikan would start his stopwatch. It would keep falling until it would reach the bottom mark. Millikan would enter the time it took each drop to fall. Then he'd turn on the electric field, turning the oil droplet into a rising star. At the bottom mark, he'd start the watch, letting it run until the rising drop would cross the finish line on top. Again and again, He'd record how long it took to rise and fall, often observing a single droplet hours on end. Hundreds of measurements were taken, recorded, mused over, and eventually analyzed to give the most accurate measurement ever made of the fundamental unit of electric charge. And more important, he established that every charge was a whole number multiple of a fundamental charge. Robert A. Millikan's fort was precision an ability to detect and eliminate error, and with extraordinary diligence and creativity to improve on existing tools. In 1923, he became the first native-born American to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. Millikan went on to head the California Institute of Technology, an American institution, and to become one himself. His name became, and remains, synonymous with scientific progress. In the first half of the 20th century, his image, next to Albert Einstein's,
was that of the most famous physicist in North America. When Millikan did his experiments, he would gather his results together, write them up in a paper, and publish them in a scientific journal for all the world to see. But before he did all that, while he was working by himself in his laboratory, he had to have a place to write down what he saw as it happened. That place was in his laboratory notebook. Now his notebooks were designed only for his own eyes. He never intended for anyone else to see them. This page is dated Wednesday, December 20th, 1911. Here, Millikan writes down the temperature and the pressure in the room. And here, under the letter G for gravity, a series of figures, each one of which is the time it took his oil drop to fall between the two scratch marks on his telescopes. Then, a similar column under F for field, the electric field. And again, the times it takes his oil drop to fall. And finally, here, Millikan reaches his result. And then he writes, this is almost exactly right. But how can he say that? He's supposed to be measuring a fundamental constant of nature whose value he doesn't know in advance. Why does he say this is right? On another page he writes, beauty. On this page, beauty, publish. And another, very low, something wrong. And then he makes a very revealing note. Not sure of distance. 1.273. There it is. When he gets a result he doesn't like, he doesn't throw it away, because that would be cheating. What he does instead is to examine the apparatus to find something wrong, so he has a reason for throwing it away. Of course, when he gets a result that he does like, he doesn't examine the apparatus nearly as carefully to find out what went right. Obviously, that creates a powerful bias in his method to get the result he wants. Another page. Here. Best yet. Beauty. Publish. And so on. For pages and pages and pages. The point is not at all that Robert Millikan was a bad scientist. He wasn't. He was a great scientist. But by examining these notes, we can get a brief insight into how science is really done. What Millikan was doing wasn't cheating. He was using his scientific judgment. And in fact, it must be that way, because no one ever stumbles onto a scientific discovery. Every discovery is made in the course of an experiment that was exquisitely designed to give the results that the scientist expects to find. And the scientist knows that quite possibly, fame and other rewards will be waiting if a great discovery is made. But then, what prevents someone from making a discovery that isn't real? The answer is, the experiment can be repeated somewhere else, by someone else, to see if it's right. It's often said that the immense success of some scientific enterprise was due to something called the scientific method, and that a key part of that method is the unprejudiced, dispassionate collection of scientific data, and that if other fields were able to imitate that magic scientific method, they could be just as successful. Well, in fact, that just isn't the case. Passion and prejudice are never very far from the scientific process. The safeguard is not disinterested scientists, but rather the fact that all scientists believe, at the very core of their beings, that experiments can be repeated. That belief is the central tenet in every scientist's faith.
This material is based upon work supported by the National Science Foundation under grant number SPE 8318420. Any opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation.